I'm Jasmine Moradi. And I'm Josie Strange Christie. And you are listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast about workplace role models where we get the opportunity to ask 60 plus questions to female influencers about their journey into STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Our vision with this podcast is to raise the workplace ecosystem for women in tech. Our mission is to bridge the gap between schools and workplaces by highlighting female role models in STEM to encourage women, girls, non-binary, and transgendered individuals to unleash their full potential in these fields to reach top leadership roles. And to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture to retain diverse talent. So we keep the workforce power equal to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. In this episode, Josie and I are very excited to welcome our guest, Tech Queen Karen Hennessy, Director of Product Management for User Trust and Privacy at Google. Hi, Karen. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Josie. We are very happy to have you joining us from US today. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm getting ready for the holidays. We are happy to hear that. Now, let us dive into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus questions. Ready. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? I would say curious, oversubscribed, and hungry. How would you describe your life in three sentences? A busy house full of boys creating the future of people-centered ads and trying to enjoy it all. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? Definitely a top hits kind of person. So pop and hip hop are definitely most stimulating for me. What's your personal motto? Try your best. What is your favorite book? I'll admit I haven't really read a full book in a while, but I'm going to say maybe right now, actually, it's the Smitten Kitchen's original cookbook, which I'm cooking from and keeps me sane and fed. What is your favorite podcast? I'm really enjoying On with Kara Swisher right now. She's an incredible interviewer and always has a perspective. I also love The Daily by The New York Times because it introduces me to tons of topics that I wouldn't necessarily be diving into. And I love Michael Favaro's and her that he's so famous for. Mac or PC? Mac. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. I am a pretty good chef. What is your hidden talent? I'm not sure it's entirely hidden, but maybe it's sort of invisible. I have a really incredible memory. I can remember lots and lots of things that I probably should not be remembering. If you were going to write a book about your life, what would a title be? Learn as you go. Great start, Karen. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about others and the world. I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up? I was born and raised in Kansas near a city called Wichita and the town I'm from is called Derby. What was your dream job as a child? As a kid, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I really loved animals and science and that seemed like the perfect combination. What was your favorite subject in school? I was always really good at math. It wasn't actually my favorite to do. I really enjoyed being good at it. I loved problems with straightforward solutions. What was your least favorite subject? I don't think I had any. I was definitely a nerd. I loved learning. I loved all subjects. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? I'm an oldish millennial. My dad was a self-taught tinkerer and he was always building computers on his own from hardware in our basement. We had a ton of these desktop computers that he made and we also had a second landline in our basement that was what we used to connect to the internet via dial-up on the modems. And I was probably about eight or so when we got that. Accidentally picking up the phone and hearing the modem screech is definitely like one of my early internet memories. Which were the three first technology gadgets you owned? Definitely the kind of desktop computers. We had a Super Nintendo, which I'd also say counts. And I'm pretty sure that I had a Palm Pilot with the stylus. Who was your female role model growing up and why? Definitely my mother and my maternal grandmother. The women in my family were all working professionals. My grandmother was a nurse and my mother worked for the city. I wouldn't say I really thought about them as being role models at the time. They just were people in my life that were doing interesting things and always very thoughtful and influential. I grew up assuming I could be anything I wanted to be, whether it was like them or something else. 
How do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? Being from a small town in a place like Kansas, I was aware that I had a narrow perspective that I wanted to challenge. So I left and moved to New York City, I think, as a solution to that. And I wanted to see the world. And ultimately, I think that led me to wanting to build products and work at a scale that would affect people in the world across cultures and places and regions at a scale that seemed a lot bigger than the place that I came from. Very interesting. Now, I'm going to read two quotes. First one. How does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So Karen, I wanna know the choices behind your career path. Where and what did you study at university? I went to Columbia University in New York City and my degree was in anthropology. Who and what influenced you to get into your chosen field? I was always really curious about human behavior and why people are the way they are and do the things they do and the intersection of culture and society and science. And I think my early teachers and professors used me to the idea that there was a discipline for that. And that's how I landed into anthropology, subsequently into product. What professional roles have you had before that led you to your current one? Before Google, I worked actually in advertising, but in the advertising services what does Google do? We organize the world's information and we try to make it universally accessible and useful. I think most people know Google for things like search and Gmail, Maps and YouTube, but that's really like at the heart of everything we do. What is your title and what are your main responsibilities? I'm a director of product management for privacy and consumer trust for our different ads products. So this means I look at how we incorporate the needs of people into Google ads and their experience with ads when it comes to privacy and usefulness and trust. And I help lead the launch of the new products, including things like my ad center, which we really just launched a couple of months ago. How did you get this current role? I was working in advertising agencies prior to coming to Google, and I was working in an area where we were trying to drive innovation using software. And one of the companies that I had picked actually for the agency to work with was bought by Google. And I came to Google shortly thereafter to join the founders and turn it into a real product and business at Google. What does a typical workday look like for you? I try to start my day with kind of a quick review of what's coming that day and the rest of the week, like a meeting with myself, basically. I do a quick email check for anything that might have come in from emails from other time zones. And then I'll generally have a couple different types of meetings. So I'll have maybe a team check-in with the things my team's working on that week, maybe a readout of some user research that we've done for something like my ad center. I try to make time for coffee in the morning and lunch in the midday, and then maybe catching up on some documents or presentations that I might be working on for upcoming meetings. I love the quote, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Karen, what do you love about your role? The thing that I love the most is working with a really amazing and brilliant team of people. You spend more time with your coworkers than you do with your family sometimes. So having an amazing team is really a big part of what I love about being here and at Google. And I love getting to understand how people think about ideas like privacy and kind of evolution of privacy and technology. What is the best experience you've had in your role so far? Any examples? I love seeing technology and design and users' experiences actually come together in a moment of delight. I think this is a lot of what product managers love, but we just launched this brand new product called My Ad Center. And the things I recall from this project really are these moments of watching like users on video experience something in the product and actually being surprised when it does exactly what they want in that like moment of, oh, we got it right. And what is the biggest challenge you have encountered so far and how did you tackle it? I think I'm still working on it. I think trying to build a shared understanding of things that might be really subjective, like privacy, has been the big new challenge. Privacy is shaped by so many different aspects of kind of the human experience, and it differs culturally and it differs locally, and it's a different way of thinking about technology and finding the right ways to have that conversation and to bring evidence and to put words to this release. Really different and diverse set of perspectives has been really hard, but also really rewarding. What do you wish everybody understood about your role? 
I wish that people understood that at Google, designing for privacy and people together means working to balance out how to create transparency and agency for people without getting in their way. But that balance doesn't actually mean trade-offs in either something that people have to give up to get something they want or making a product not work so well in order to make it deliver expectations. I think the idea that balance and trade-offs aren't necessarily the two opposite sides of the coin. What is the one common myth about your profession or field that you want to disprove? I think the one that comes up the most is that all of your information is used for ads on Google. Most of it isn't. Most of it isn't even relevant or interesting or useful for you individually. Google doesn't use Gmail. We don't use Drive. We don't use Photos for advertising. We don't listen to the phone mic to generate information for ads. And I think that's something we hear a lot from users that is just one of those urban myths that it would be great to dispel. What do you love about working in the tech industry? I love the people. The most curious, innovative minds seem like they're around you all the time. And then the opportunity to really change people's lives in major ways with technology is so cool and such an interesting and important part of it. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, Think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is another stepping stone to greatness. Karen, what have by far been your biggest achievements in your career? There are two. One, launching a product at Google that goes out to billions of people, which is what we just did with my ad center, was both terrifying, but also really satisfying and exciting to do. Definitely like a big product achievement. And I think the other thing that underlies that is bringing together a very cool, talented and diverse team of people and experts to build the product was as big a part of it as actually like shipping it to real people. What's the biggest factor that has helped you become successful? Any success habits? persistent. Don't get discouraged when things are hard or seem impossible. Be authentic. Empower others. How do you measure your own performance at work? I think it's easy to measure it by how successful other people think you are, but I try to measure it by the success of my own team. Are we happy working together and making progress on the things we care about? What is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? I don't really believe in absolute failure at work. I think that there's always going to be twists and turns that you don't necessarily anticipate. And if there are, then you're probably not looking up from the map enough to take some risks. I think that all failures have something you can probably learn. A few years back, I was working on a project where we were basically trying to rethink how creative development tools work for ad professionals and what we could do to innovate on the clunky process there. And what we found is that the timing wasn't right for users or for the company. There were a few more years of innovation and kind of magic that needed to happen before it would become more of the right time for that idea. Sometimes it's just timing that doesn't work out. What is inspiring and motivating you the most in your role and career right now? I was thinking about this one. I think the speed of technology is really inspiring and motivating. My sons are a reflection of this. They're little now, and the way that technology defines their worldview is persistently shocking me. One of my sons said the other day that he wanted to donate something to the World Wildlife Fund, and he didn't have any phone money to do it with. And this idea that digital currency exists only on your phone for my eight-year-old was like this concept that was plaguing him. And I just, that kernel for me was like so eye-opening that, wow, there's a world in which he knows how money works, but then he has this concept of there being digital money that only exists on your phone. Like those kinds of changes happening right now, I think are so inspiring. It means there's so much opportunity. Let us now jump into the influence of mentorship and role models and sponsors. Role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, mentors can guide us through our career journey, and open up the world of possibility. Sponsors match emerging talent with leaders and influential employees who can help us move ahead in our career. Karen, do you have a mentor today? I have a few mentors. Who is a female role model you look up to in your field? Certainly, Susan Wojcicki is at the top of my list, both as an early product leader and a leader at Google. She's the CEO of YouTube, but also as a working parent and, in my experience, an empathetic and a human-centered leader for her teams and organization. History shows that it has been more common for men having mentors, role models, and sponsors in business than women. Karen, how important do you think it is to have a role model, mentor, and sponsor during one's career? 
I think it's really critical to have sponsors. Mentors and role models definitely can help you shape and reflect upon what you want and the kinds of things that interest you and how to prioritize. I think sponsors have a different role, which is really helping create opportunities that might otherwise not present themselves. Sponsors, I would definitely put atop the list, and I think they're super important, especially for women in technology. Let's move on to leadership. Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, said, I quote, leadership is about making others as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. Karen, what does leadership mean to you? Well, hard to follow Cheryl. Gosh, to me, I think leadership is inspiring and providing guidance to others with empathy and authenticity. What do you consider a good versus a bad leader? A good leader is someone who believes in their team and the mission. And a bad leader is someone who leverages other things like fear or anxiety to compel people. Who is your favorite female tech leader and why? Kara Swisher. She's someone I'm thinking about and listening to now as not necessarily the leader of a technology company or like a technologist in practice herself. She's a journalist, but she is someone and a woman who's thinking about the implications of technology and the tech industry and holding people accountable. That's really important right now for leaders of all kinds, and she deserves to be up there. How would you describe yourself as a leader? I try to lead by example, focus on issues that inspire me, be authentic. I try to bring humor and care to my team. And as a leader, what values are most important to you? Authenticity is probably my top value. I think humility and confidence together are really important and someone who's willing to take risks for their team. What leadership lessons have you learned that have formed you into the leader you are today? One of the most important and maybe surprising things that I think I've learned is that when it comes to teams, building a really diverse set of skills and perspectives and passions can get you a lot further than trying to get all of those skills out of the same person. So really like building that portfolio of people with things that they're differently amazing at was not something I necessarily knew was going to be an important part of being a leader. What are your three strengths and your three weaknesses? Classic job interview question. Okay. Three strengths, confidence, competent, emotional intelligence, and weaknesses. I would also say confidence. There's a way to be overconfident. Procrastination, which is a skill, but probably not a strength. And I think I'm secretly disorganized. Amazing, Karen. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today. Unleashing the power of diversity, equality, inclusion, and belonging. Karen, what does diversity, equality, inclusion, and belonging mean to you personally? Building a culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging means empowering people to do their best work, which allows us to design and build products for everyone. What do you consider being 3 to 5 signs of good company culture if you were to join a company? Things that I would look for, or I guess pay attention to, in a good company culture, people can speak to qualities about their colleagues that aren't the things that they'll observe in their projects together. So the non-work lives or the characteristics of their colleagues, they care about each other, they will be able to speak to those things. I think support for risk-taking and what we call blameless postmortems at Google, this idea that failures are an opportunity to learn and that no single person is to blame. There are lots of different people involved in decisions. And then I think diversity across like every characteristic of the spectrum, whether that's age, gender, background, location that people are in or where they're coming from. Those would be the top three things I would look for to enable good company culture. As a woman, what has been the most significant barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? I haven't viewed this exactly as a barrier, but I think that personally, and I think maybe women in general, aren't really raised to speak out or up in a room with crowded voices. I think being willing to take just that small risk even has enabled me to drive more influence and participate in ways that probably have contributed to my success. As a kid, I was a shy kid, and I think probably now people would be surprised to hear that if they know me. But it always took a little more for me to be able to speak up, but I think it probably was an important change I Why do you think it's important for more women to join the tech industry, especially as leaders? All of the data shows that it matters. There are a lot of studies I think out there now that indicate that with women in leadership and in positions of influence, companies do better, both financially and longevity wise. So if half the world is women in tech, we need people designing products that work for everyone. And a lot of industries haven't done so well here. And I think technology is still young enough where we can do better. 
Do you and how do you speak with your female and male colleagues about DEIB challenges, especially salary gaps and promotions? I definitely do. I try to empower my team and my colleagues with transparency and information and the idea that you can advocate for yourself and your teams for equity and fairness. I think more information people have, the better position you're in to advocate. Definitely try to share as much information here as possible and make sure that people are asking questions. You're a successful FEMA director at Google. However, there are many public and internal discussions about the barriers women face from reaching higher position in the tech industry. How do you feel it has affected and is affecting you? And what is your advice on how to best unblock these roadblocks? It's a big problem. And there are lots of different challenges. I think some are institutional and others are things individuals can take action on. There's a lot of data that shows how having a family and the role of women in the work at home, cost of childcare, the normative values of families, those impact women's ability to advance in a lot of fields and tech's not excluded from that. So I think raising awareness of this definitely is a good starting point across a lot of dimensions. I also think being honest about what anyone gives up to reach childcare positions of influence in their careers, men and women, but especially women, and how that really shares with those cultural norms. I think it helps women feel less guilty about some of the realities. It's talking about that even just makes me feel less guilty about the choices I have to make that anyone has to make to figure out how to spend what you have, which is a limited amount of time. The tech industry finds it hard to especially retain women. They spend a lot of marketing money to track them, but it's super important to retain them. What is your best advice on strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages gender diversity and equality? We've expanded how we kind of support employees and help employees thrive and are seeing good results in inclusion and equity and retention there. I think every organization now within Google has a dedicated team or effort to support underrepresented groups. I think that's been an important corporate structure that's been helpful. I think also encouraging and empowering men to advocate for this through things like sponsorship programs also helps. It's not just about women supporting other women, but everyone working to create better representation Equity. What would you say are the few challenges of implementing diversity, equality, inclusion and belonging culture in a workplace today? Challenging social norms anywhere feels disruptive and people generally want to work happily together without discomfort and anxiety that might be caused by disrupting norms. I think that just acknowledging that is a good step. It can also feel like a long process if teams aren't starting from a balanced place and so progress can feel really slow. Bringing people onto teams making sure that everyone is set up for success. Like that can be the years in the making kind of challenge. Sometimes it might feel like nothing's happening and that's just because the pace of things takes a while. Why and how do you think companies would benefit from having workplace gender diversity and equality, especially better gender representation at sea level? As I mentioned before, I think the studies seem to show that companies benefit directly, like financially. For most companies, that's something that they're optimizing for. I would be speculating on the underlying reasons for that, but given what I know about product management and building inclusive teams at Google, having a wider range of perspectives of the human experience represented on your teams is always better for creating products and services that are meant for other humans. So it's pretty obvious that having representation, if you're looking to serve that same group, is really important. How much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding diversity, equality, inclusion and belonging since you joined? I think it's changed a lot. I was in my mid-20s when I started in tech. There were so few female founders starting companies, especially outside traditional female sectors like retail or fashion. Now you have women getting ideas off the ground across the spectrum, healthcare, finance, all the traditional industries, whereas before I don't think you saw that. It feels like it's changed a lot even in the past decade. Then looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? More discussion and awareness, just calling it out and talking about it in the moment does make a difference. A lot of bias is unintentional, especially the small things that tend to add up and really affect your experience at work or in a meeting. And not being afraid to call those out more and just quick correct on things really does help people and change behavior. Then looking forward, what will do as a leader to improve the bias for the next generation of women in tech? Being present remembering like what it has been like to build a career and being aware of investing time and energy in that, being active. 
Let's move on to another hot topic in business today, which is work-life balance and mental health. Karen, you without a doubt have a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself and maintain a good mental health? I practice meditation. I try to eat a healthy diet and stay hydrated and get enough sleep. Have you ever experienced burnout? Everyone experiences it a bit. And I think the solution is just taking a break. It's critical, even if it's just a day to yourself to fully separate from the things that are mentally and physically exhausting you can be really restorative. What is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in the new now? Destigmatizing mental health as part of general health and wellness is really important. In addition to that, having broad support for a range of benefits in this area, whether that's virtual or live, and then flexibility in work hours and locations also is a big add there. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? Well, usually there is a small person physically getting me out of my bed. So I would say my kids, definitely the opportunity to do cool things at work. And it's a beautiful world out there. So it doesn't take much. Now let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Karen, what is the best piece of advice you have been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? It's just work. And then what is the worst advice you've ever been given? And how did you tackle it? I'm not sure I've ever been given really terrible advice, or if I did, I just ignored it and then I forgotten what it was. I think some of the less good advice has definitely been to be more conservative and take fewer risks. I think that's the safe route and would have led me down a less interesting and exciting path. Is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you would have had when starting out in the tech industry? This is maybe true for lots of industries, but maybe surprising for tech. I think brevity and conciseness in writing is really important when it comes to communication styles, even in technical disciplines. And as a student of social sciences, I am prone to like longer, wordier prose and usually have to edit myself down if I can. But if you do that, you can spend less time and do more. If you had the ability to go back in time when you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? It turns out that most decisions don't matter. So try not to agonize over everything. Spend the proper amount of time on the big ones and you'll probably save yourself a lot of trouble and stress. What advice would you give to young girls and women who want and are trying to break into the STEM field today, especially wanting to become the next generation leaders? It's important, as I did growing up, to really believe that you can do anything that you want. It's up to you. And then I think the second part of that is to really find people who support your interests and will teach you and introduce you to those opportunities. Last but not least, what is next for you in your role and career in tech? What are your career aspirations? I will counter this question with the idea that sometimes it's okay not to be looking at the next thing. I'm actually doing exactly what I want to be doing right now. My ad center has just launched. It was a big project. Next year, we'll be spending a lot of time really learning and listening to users to understand how it works for them. And then I think balancing my career and my work at home, being present for my family is what I'm going to be focused on. Definitely watching how exciting developments in places like machine learning and artificial intelligence will change the conversation, but I'm not looking at the next thing. I'm pretty happy where I am. Thank you so much, Karen, for being a guest on the Queens of Tech podcast. Sharing your journey will without a doubt inspire change and reshape company culture for the next generation of women in tech. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to hello at queensof.tech. For more podcast episodes and on how to support the Queens of Tech initiative, visit queensof.tech.